Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's so great to be here. What a fantastic day. You have come on Lake Day. It's going to be a great day. If you have a nervousness about getting wet, by the end of this service, you're going to want to get wet. I promise you. And I'll tell, explain that in just a moment. I wanted to also take a moment of personal privilege. Say, Jessup is starting classes next week, so please be praying for us. That's exciting. Uh, graduate classes go all year long, but traditional undergraduate will start next week. And so we're excited for Monday. And then also, uh, number one intercessor, Mrs. Jackson, is here today. My wife, Pam Jackson, is here in the front row, so we're grateful to have her. So I just want to advance tell you, you will receive uh, one fewer story than the first service, but you can watch the video if you want to see that. Actually, I got to tell you this. Honestly, um, normally I really like to come to Hills Church. You know that. I'm always excited when I'm here. I feel like this is home. This is a great place. I'm normally very excited. Today, I'm a little bit stressed. And I'll tell you why I'm stressed. I was looking back. The last several weeks, the guest speakers you had have been able to speak on any topic that they want. But when Matt called me, he said, John, I need you to speak about baptism. And I need you not only to speak about baptism, John, I need you to review all of scripture, take 2,000 years of church history, address every doctrinal issue, and make sure that people walk out of this room totally united and for each other. Can you do that? And John, if you do it in 30 minutes, it'll be great. <laughs> and then he said, and if you don't do it in 30 minutes, it'll be really awful. Thanks, Matt. Just really appreciate the freedom here. It's awesome, awesome. Actually, actually, I'm excited about this. I, I have taught on this subject before, but never in this way. So buckle your seatbelts. I'm getting ready to go. I want to talk to you primarily about baptism in the New Testament, time of Jesus forward. And since I'm a college president, I'm going to do a little teaching here and give you a quick history. There's also baptism in the Old Testament. But in the Old Testament, there's only two kinds of baptism. Old Testament, as you uh, remember, tells the story of God's people, the Jewish people, the 12 tribes of Israel. Two types of baptism in the Old Testament. The first was called ritual purification. A Jew prior to the time of Jesus would know about going to the temple and maybe receiving ritual purification. We would think, oh, they just took a shower. No, no, no. This was a religious duty. They were getting purified and they were getting to the place where they would present themselves before the Lord and there was a ritual kind of washing that they did. That's the first. Number two, the second kind of baptism in the Old Testament was when a Gentile, a non-Jew, now I want to clear this up for some of you. Some of you go like, uh, what's, what's a Gentile? Well, the Jews were the 12 tribes of Israel. If you could trace your descendancy directly from the 12 tribes of Israel, you were a Jew in the pages of scripture. By the way, a Samaritan was a half-breed. A Samaritan was a person who had Jewish blood, but also had intermingled with other blood. Now, most of us in this room are like that. Like we look at our family lines, we've got all kinds of background. Well, a Gentile, the easiest way to remember it is a Gentile is a non-Jew. So anybody who wasn't Jewish was Gentile. So the second kind of baptism in the Old Testament was when a Gentile person would convert to Judaism. When a Gentile person converted to Judaism, they would have a special ceremony, a baptism, where that person, by that rite, by that ritual of baptism, would demonstrate that they were converting from their former pagan religion into Judaism. Is that clear? Two kinds of Old Testament and the Old Testament. Two kinds of baptism. Now, let me say this. The Old Testament knows nothing, nothing of a baptism where a Jewish person would get baptized to move into a different stream within their faith. They knew about ritual purification, but they knew nothing about a Jewish person being baptized to move into a new uh, stream of faith. But you're gonna notice in our first biblical passage, the context. The John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus. There's a passage in John chapter one. I wanna kind of lay the foundation here. I'm gonna give you three New Testament passages today to talk about baptism. John chapter one. Now some Pharisees, those are religious leaders, who had been sent, questioned him, questioned John the Baptist. Why then do you baptize if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Well, I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. 
Then John gave this testimony. I saw the spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except the one who sent me to baptize with water told me. The man on whom you see the spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this, talking about Jesus, is the son of God. Let me give you a quick little context. There's this guy named John the Baptist. We actually know from other places in scripture that he's the cousin of Jesus. He's older than Jesus. He's born before Jesus. When Mary is pregnant with Jesus, she goes to visit Elizabeth. So John the Baptist is older than Jesus, and he has a special responsibility. Uh, Many people call John the Baptist the forerunner. His whole purpose in life was to announce the coming of the Messiah. So John gets to a certain point in his life and he begins to go out and declare to Jewish people that you need to repent of your sins. You need to look for the Messiah, the coming one, and recognize that even though you're following all the Jewish traditions and rituals, that your heart is a million miles away from God. He preaches a baptism of repentance. We'll talk about that in just a few moments. But when he does preach that, John is kind of a wild man. This is the way the Bible describes him. He says he eats locusts and wild honey. So like you're thinking of locusts, like, okay, grasshoppers and honey. Well, like the honey I'm, I'm down with, the locusts, not so much. But he eats those. He's dressed in camel hair. He's probably like a wild man. If you've seen The Chosen, that seems like a pretty good description where it's kind of like, like he's not a guy who's sitting at the city council meeting behind the podium, okay? He, he's kind of a wild man. And he's telling people in a thundering way, be baptized. But one day he sees Jesus walking by walking by the Jordan River, and he says, behold, the Lamb of God. That may not mean much to you, but to a first century Jew to say that that was the Lamb of God would indicate that it's not just the lambs that were sacrificed on a regular basis in the Jewish festivals and the the Passover and other observances, but the Lamb of God was God's perfect, permanent sacrifice. See, if you were a Jewish person, it was regular to do sacrifices, to go to the temple, to make all kinds of religious observances because of your sin and your awareness of that. You recognized that you needed God, you needed a savior, but your sins had to be forgiven over and over and over and over again. And Jesus was pointed to as the lamb of God. Now we know from another gospel that the way it worked is that Jesus actually came to John the Baptist and said, I need to be baptized. Now, I got to be honest with you. If I'm at the lake today with Hills Church and I'm one of the pastors who's baptizing or however you guys do that, and, and, and Jesus shows up to be baptized me, I'm absolutely not. In fact, I was thinking about this. If Jonathan Rumi showed up, I would absolutely... Four of you have watched The Chosen? Come on, come on. If Jonathan Rumi showed up, I'd go like, no, I don't want to baptize you. Well, that's exactly what John the Baptist did. He said, there's no way, Jesus, that I should baptize you. You should baptize me. And Jesus said this. Let this to be done to fulfill all righteousness. One of the gospels records that when John puts Jesus down under the water and he comes up, there's a voice from heaven where God the Father is saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then it says from this passage that the spirit of God descends like a dove. Now, to be honest, my own personal preference would have been a screaming eagle, But, but that didn't happen. So the spirit comes like a dove and sits on Jesus. And everybody realizes this, this is a unique moment in history. This is a powerful moment. And Jesus says, let this be done to fulfill all righteousness. Baptism becomes kind of a new introduced thing. But then you fast forward. I want to go quickly for you today because Matt gave me 30 minutes. So I want to go quickly. It's okay. You guys okay with me making fun of Matt? Are you okay with that? I'll stop it eventually. So uh, the reality is, is that um, fast forward, Jesus goes to the cross. And when Jesus Christ goes on the cross, he spreads out his arm, not because it was a cruel twist of fate, not because of the cruelty of the Roman government or first century Jews. Jesus spreads out his arm and goes to the cross and allows himself to be crucified. At any moment, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he stays on that cross because he loves you so much, because he loves me so much. And he hangs on that cross. And then at the very end, he says, it is finished. And when he says it is finished, he gives up his spirit. His body is taken down from the the cross ultimately and laid in the tomb. But by the way, when he said it is finished, the veil in the temple tore and the access to the Holy of Holies was there now available. And it was an epoch in history that was changing everything. Jesus gets laid in the tomb. On the third day, he's raised up. He appears to his disciples. He tells them to stay in Jerusalem. How many people were fed by the five loaves and two fish? 5,000. There were several other times where Jesus fed multitudes. 
He did miracles. There were multitudes that gathered around him. In the upper room in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter two, there were 120 people gathered. 120 people gathered in that place on what we now call the day of Pentecost. Jesus had told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit came and Peter and the disciples started prophesying and preaching and teaching the people. Crowds of Jerusalem, of Jews there around the city and this was amazing. And then in Acts 2.36 we read this. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God would call. The fact is, is that Peter makes a declaration. He says, this Jesus who you crucified, That doesn't feel very friendly to me. But when the Holy Spirit came, that's what Peter articulated. This Jesus whom you crucified, God has made him Lord and Christ. He is the Savior sent from the Father. He's the Lamb of God. He was fulfilling all that John the Baptist and the Old Testament prophets had declared. So when Peter declared this, all the people in the crowd said, oh my goodness, what do we need to do? We've crucified the Messiah. What do we need to do? And and Peter says two words, repent and be baptized. Now I gotta quickly tell you, a lot of people when they hear the word repent, hear the phrase repaint. And if you've ever repainted before and you've done it badly, what you've done is saw that you needed to paint and you said, huh, I'll do this, I'll fix this quickly. And you got some paint and you painted over the old paint. And what happened when you painted fresh paint over the old paint? It wasn't too long before the new paint started crackling again and nothing was changed. If you really want to repaint well, you've got to sand and get down to the raw wood and then put a fresh coat over you. Can I tell you what the word repent really means? It doesn't mean repaint. The word repent says if you're going this way and you see where your life is heading and you recognize the cost of your life choices, if you get to the point where you understand, I am a sinner, I've messed up once or 10,000 times, doesn't matter, I've messed up, I'm separated from a holy and perfect God. If you know that you're going that way and you say, I really want to change and I really want to believe that God loves me so much that he'd make it possible for me to be reconciled with him. When you repent, you say, look, instead of going this way, I'm going to turn and make a direction this way. Repentance is a turn of direction. So I want to say this to you, and I want you to look right up here and hear me carefully. I'm sorry. I'm really, really sorry. For anybody who's watching online, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if somehow, some way, I or any other pastor, or any other teacher taught you that God's grace is easy and that following him is easy. Because that is wrong. That is not in scripture. God's grace is free. It's his unmerited favor. He pours out to us. The Bible said he lavishes us. God can take you and all your stuff and wrap you up. He knows everything you've ever been through. He loves you with a deeper love that's unimaginable. But in that deep love that he loves you with, he provided for you a way to have forgiveness of your sins and restoration and relationship. And when Jesus died on the cross, he gave that to you. Grace is easy. It cost him everything. It's easy for us to receive, but it cost him everything. Now look right up here. I want to say I'm sorry if you ever heard that grace is easy and that following Jesus is easy. Following Jesus is not easy. Following Jesus requires obedience, surrender. So I want to say this to you. I want hundreds of people to be baptized today. In just a few moments, I'm going to describe to you why some of you in this room might say, I'm going to get baptized But as I say that, if you get baptized just because you know that they give out a cool t-shirt when you get baptized, if you get baptized just because you seriously want to get wet, you're hoping they give you more food if you show up at the stand wet, folks, baptism is not a casual thing. Baptism is when we say, I realize that my life was going this way 
and I realize how much God loves me and how much Jesus sacrificed on the cross, I do want to urge you, by the way, if you have not watched The Chosen, please, please, please watch The Chosen. It will help you understand just a little bit more of the story. I think, by the way, one of the greatest things The Chosen has done for me is it's lifted up the humanity of the disciples and the humanity of Jesus. Like Jesus was a real flesh and blood human being who had come and fully human and fully God. By the way, the disciples are fully human. They're knuckleheads. They're absolute, total knuckleheads. But that kind of helps me. It helps me go like, okay, yeah, I could see that. That's how maybe I would be on a regular basis. So I want to tell you this. It's easy to receive God's grace, but it is not easy to follow Jesus. Baptism is a decision to say, yes, I'll follow him. So he tells this crowd, you got to repent. You got to be baptized. And they make the decision, okay, what are we going to do? We're going to follow Jesus. And so 5,000 people that day get baptized. Now, let me give you a quick little bit of church history. Baptism was not always easy. At the beginning, it was easy to be a Christian, to say yes, to follow him, to repent, and to get baptized. But then the church began to be persecuted. And when the church was persecuted, sometimes baptisms had to be done in secret. And sometimes to be a Christian had to be a really hard, challenging thing. And so I want to take you to the next passage. This is an exhortation in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. This is the Apostle Paul. He's writing from a prison cell, and he writes these words. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. i got to stop for just a second. You know that phrase, bearing with one another in love? I did some research. I have a really big, complicated family. I hope I don't uh, uh, insult anybody except my family. They'll maybe watch later. But... uh, like, have you ever seen the, the movies of My Big Fat Greek Wedding? Like, our family's like that. We're not even Greek. But everybody's loud and noisy, and they're in everybody's business and all that stuff. And so one time I was reading through this passage, and I said, what does that mean to bear with one another in love? Have you ever had to bear with one another in love? Like, your family? Do you put up with anybody in your family? Well, that's actually what the word bear with one another or forbearance in some translation. It means put up with. That, to me, was like very helpful. Like, yes, I need to put up with people just like they need to put up with me. That's kind of what you do in family, and that's definitely what you do in a church family. So the reality is, as we do this, we go on. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called the one hope who you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all in all. The fact is, is that when we are baptized, we are joining with saints through the ages. I have the privilege to um, know Francis Chan. And Francis uh, came to Jessup a couple years ago, and he just delivered such a powerful word on church unity. This is what Francis said. He said, usually I think about church unity, and I think about um, being united with Christians in other places. So for instance, you probably think about this, right? You think, uh, if there's another church in town or in the region that loves Jesus, teaches the Bible as God's word, helps people grow spiritually, I'm for them, right? Like, we're on the same team. We're not against them. We're all just trying to be faithful to Jesus. Hills Church, by the way, it's not about programs. It's not about advertising. It's not about activities. Hills Church is to help you know Jesus, to experience him, and to walk with him, to encounter him, and to be able to share his love with others. And we're in partnership with anybody that, but... Here's what Francis said. He said, God had been showing him that Christian unity wasn't just about unity with people next door or in another place in the world. That unity actually means that we're in union with all the believers through the years. In just a few moments, we're gonna receive the communion elements. When you receive communion today, you are not only in unity with all other followers of Jesus who participate in the bread and the cup, You are in unity with the saints through the ages who have participated in the communion experience or in the Passover. There's a continuity of faith that goes. So when you think about baptism, I want you to think about that in terms of I'm stepping into something that's a couple thousand years old and that Jesus Christ himself modeled. It was repeated in the early church and there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Now, Matt didn't really make all the challenges to me uh, that I described. He did say, could you talk about baptism? And so I just fluffed it up a little bit. That's what pastors do. So I just fluffed it up a little bit. Uh, But I do want to answer one question. What about baptism and salvation? Like, do you have to be baptized in order to be saved? Well, let me say this to you. 
Salvation is all about what Jesus Christ did on the cross. When he shed his blood, he made it possible for us to be restored and reconciled to relationship with God. In fact, there's a passage in 2 Corinthians that says that when we come to know Christ, we're actually ambassadors of reconciliation. We're begging people to be reconciled to God. But I believe that baptism is to salvation like words are to ideas. Have you ever had an idea that you didn't express? Please say yes. So the reality is until you express the idea with the words that come out of your mouth, that word has not manifested your idea. When you express the word, the word is is manifesting your idea. When you make a decision to say yes to Jesus Christ and you say, I'm not going to get up to heaven. This is what a lot of people do. Someday I'm going to get up to heaven and I'm going to just say, God, I, I was pretty good. And what we'll think about is, God, um, I was better than, and we'll name some people that we were better than. Can I tell you, folks, God does not grade on a curve. He grades on a cross. The only thing that the Father looks at is the sacrifice of the Son. God come in the flesh, Jesus, who hangs on the cross for our sins and is willing to do that and makes it possible for all of us to enter in. But the reality is this. I don't believe that baptism saves you, but I believe it is a necessary step of discipleship. It's essential. It's an act of obedience. I'll give you one more passage, Acts chapter eight. Philip is is, uh, talking to this Ethiopian eunuch and he starts teaching him about the Bible and he says this. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, Here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Let me say this to you. There's three categories of people I want to talk to today. The first is this. Maybe you're in the place today where you say, honestly, pastor, I I do not know Jesus Christ. I've maybe gone to church a few times, but the bottom line is there's no centering in my life with Jesus. There's no relationship. Like I don't have a connection. I go to church sometimes, but I don't really know Jesus. If you have any lack of clarity that you know Jesus, today when we finish the service, there's a table out there. It's gonna talk about baptism and they will help you take the steps to yield in your life to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you this, God knows every single detail about your life. He knows stuff that your spouse doesn't know. He not only knows what you've done, he knows what you've thought. And he loves you so much that he gave his own son to die on the cross. Hills Church is not about programs, activities, advertising, all that stuff's fine. But what all that stuff is about is to help us come to a relationship with Jesus. And so if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I beg of you, take this moment. I didn't do this in the first service. I didn't mean to do it now, but it's coming to me. So I'm going to say it. A week ago, nine days ago, uh, our niece, uh, who's in her early 30s, she and her three precious children were in a car. They were driving on a road and a logging truck came from the other way and the guy fell asleep and went into her lane, head on, a semi-logging truck uh, runs into her. And we get the news. I actually was on an airplane. We get the news and we think that she's gone. Like, she... You get a head on, like, how do you know, folks? How many more days do you have guaranteed on this planet? Now, thanks be to God, by the way, our niece is okay. She's in the hospital. The Lord touched her life and in this case, spared her life. And she's now up and walking and we're grateful to the father for what he did for her and for those three precious babies. They're all okay. So that's amen. That's God. But folks, we don't have any guarantees. I'm telling you, I've had the privilege and the awesome um, responsibility to be with people when they drew their last breath. It's it's a holy, sacred moment. And folks, we don't know if that's going to be today or 30 years from now, 50 years from now, however old you are. We don't know. I'm just telling you, if you do not know that you know that you know that you've surrendered your heart and life to Jesus, I want to beg of you to make today to the day. The second thing, second group of people is maybe you've been at church for years and maybe it being in church for years has been part of your life. Maybe you got baptized as a kid. And so like, you know about baptism, 
But to be honest, your life has been such that, to be frank, like baptism had no meaning to you. Or it, it never happened for you. Maybe you were just, you've been to church, but you never got baptized. My prayer is that you would say today, today's the day. I'm gonna make that commitment. And yes, it's a little scary. It's in front of my friends. It's gonna be out at the lake and all that. That's a little scary. Here's the third and final one. Um, Some of us got baptized and we knew exactly what we were doing. But then we walked away. Many years ago, we had the privilege to be in Southern California. We were around Saddleback Church. And I used to get exposed to a fair amount of Saddleback stuff. And I, I, they would always have testimonies in the middle of their service. And people would share about their life. And I, I began to notice a pattern. A lot of their testimonies at Saddleback came from what's called CR, Celebrate Recovery. It was men and women who at some point in their life were going straight. But then they got trapped in an addiction. They got trapped in a series of behaviors that brought destruction to them and to their families. So maybe you're here today and you say, look, man, nobody knows this, but I'm that person. I've been trapped in a cycle of addiction or behavior that's destructive in my life. And maybe that's not you, but maybe you're a family member that's been deeply wounded and affected by a, a loved one in your family that's participating in that. I just want to tell you that if you long for freedom, that the Spirit of God longs to give you the freedom you so richly desire. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But he longs to give it to you. Two weeks ago, I was up in Truckee. Had the privilege to be with our um, student leadership at Jessup. There are about 60, 65 students. And uh, I had re- prepared remarks. You know, as a president, you got to say certain things. So I, I had prepared remarks. But I was looking at them. I just, a thought came into me. I was looking at them. I thought, What's the ripple effect of these students' lives? I thought about, man, they're 18 to 22 or something like that. Um, what's it going to be like 20 years from now for them, 40 years from now, 60 years from now? And I felt like I just had this image of, of I'm sowing seeds, we're sowing seeds, and, and Jessup's sowing seeds, and some of the soil is going to be 30, 60, 100-fold. So, so I didn't plan to do this, but it just came to me. And I said, students, I want you to hear this. I believe the Lord is calling us to the single greatest year of discipleship in the history of Jessup. They didn't know this, and you would have no way of knowing. This is our 85th birthday. It's our 20th year in this region. And I am believing that this will be the single greatest year of discipleship. And so I want to share that with you. What would it be like if in August of 2024, you put a stake in the ground and you said, this is the year, this is the moment, this is the month, This is the day when I say, I am consecrating my life to follow Jesus. If you surrender and yield your life to Jesus, do you have any idea what impact that'll make in your marriage, with your children, with your siblings, with your grandchildren? It's never too late to say today is the day. So I want you to be baptized today. I don't want to give you a gentle nudge. I'm going to shove you into the waters of baptism. So if you've never been baptized, if you're not clear about where you stand with Jesus, or if you're trapped and you want to be set free, this is a moment where you can make your decision. And to experience Christian unity, we're also going to celebrate in just a few moments the Lord's Supper. We're going to celebrate communion. The reality is, is that these communion elements are not just symbolic. They actually represent and are in alignment with what Jesus said in the words of Scripture. When he was celebrating the meal with his disciples, they came to the bread that was a common part of the meal, and and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you, and he broke it. Later on the same meal, he would take the cup. And it's normally in the Jewish Passover, that would have been the cup of iniquity, But instead of the cup of iniquity, he said, this cup is the cup of a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. This is my body. This is my blood. I really believe that this morning, Jesus is present. I told the worship team between the first and the second service, I felt like there was a special kind of anointing on their worship today, a special kind of leading us into the presence. I felt like there's something here. I don't know anything about your life. I don't know anything about your circumstances, but I know this. I know somebody who knows every detail of your life and loves you fully and completely. So I'm going to give you a few moments in just a minute. I'm going to pray over you. 
but you can take the bread and you can take the cup and recognize that this is the body of Jesus. This is the shed blood of Jesus. And by his body and his blood, we enter into relationship with the Father. And we join with saints through the ages because there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. With your eyes closed, Spirit of the living God, give us these moments to prepare our hearts. Lord, when we're ready, I ask that you give us the freedom to receive the elements, the bread and the cup, But Lord, as we have these moments and receive the bread and the cup, I pray that your Holy Spirit will have so stirred our hearts and lives that we would enter in to divine communion with you. That we'd recognize your presence and that the bread and cup would symbolize our desire to follow you. And I pray, Jesus, that many, many people would be baptized today that this would be a stake in the ground. This would be a mile marker. This would be a moment that would be transformational for the rest of our lives and for those we love and care for. Thank you, Jesus.